Hello, this video is about the case study of Henry Malayson. Malayson. Um, he's so famous in psychology that when you're referring to him in the exam, you can simply write HM. And it's really important that you know the case study of Henry Malayson for several reasons. Um, so I'm just going to explain the case study to you if you're not aware of it. And then we're going to look at all the ways that the case you might be able to use the case study in the exams. Um, so Henry Malayson uh, was quite an incredible person and we should always treat him with the utmost respect because we have learned so much from his case study and yet he suffered so terribly because of what happened to him. So as a child he had an injury which caused him to have severe epilepsy and the epilepsy was so bad that he couldn't really function in everyday life so he um, dropped out of high school, he couldn't really maintain a job um, because his health was so, so bad because of the epilepsy that it was destroying his whole life. And so what happened was there was this surgeon called Dr Scoville who had a, an idea that if he removed um, Henry Malayson's hippocampus that it would cure his epilepsy but this was um, pioneering surgery this was surgery that had never been done before to remove the whole hippocampus and so Dr Scoville you know advised that although he thought it would cure the epilepsy one he wasn't 100% sure and two he wasn't sure whether there might be any long-lasting side effects of this procedure so um, but Henry Malayson decided alongside his parents at the age of 27 that he would undergo the surgery because his life was just so difficult with the epilepsy and they, he decided to take that risk so uh, Scoville performed the surgery and removed the whole of the hippocampus from his brain and it did cure the epilepsy but it had very long lasting side effects. In fact, what happened was for the rest of his life, Henry Malayson, um, his memory was affected. So if you've done the memory unit, then you will know that there is a distinction between short term memory and long term memory. And we know about this because of the case study of Henry Malayson. So short term memory you can see as a picture there of a goldfish because goldfishes notoriously have a very very short term memory you know about two seconds supposedly and so i've used that to demonstrate to illustrate the idea of short term memory so if you've done the memory unit you will know that short term memory has a capacity of five to nine items it has a duration of 0 to 30 seconds and that coding is acoustic so the duration, if you haven't yet, you will do soon, but the duration of short term memory is literally 30 seconds. Um, there's a distinction between short term memory and long term memory. So you can see there a picture of an elephant and that's because elephants never forget. And so that represents long term memory. Um, the capacity of long term memory is unlimited. The duration is about two minutes to forever and the coding is semantic. So long term memories can last a lifetime. And what happened from HM's neurosurgery was that his short term memory was still intact. So he still had that uh, working memory, but he couldn't form any new long term memories. He did have um, memories from before the procedure. So he knew his parents and could remember his upbringing. Um, but he couldn't form any new long term memories. So essentially, Henry Malayson was left with a memory which only lasted up to 30 seconds and that lasted for the whole of his life and he died when he was 84 um, so he spent from the age of 27 to 84 not being able to form any new long-term memories so <clears throat> that wasn't quite the end of the story though um, this lady here is called Brenda Milner and she is an incredible woman if you Google her. She's, um, this is her when I think she was 95 and still working in the universities about memory. But back in the 1950s when Henry Malayson had his surgery, um, she was a PhD student, so working towards her doctorate, and she was asked to work with Henry Malayson. And what she did um, was 
she asked them to do the concentric star experiment. So if you look at that picture there, you can see that there's one star inside another one. And Henry was asked to draw between the lines of the concentric stars, but he was only allowed to look at his reflection in a mirror. And if you're one of my students, I know that you will have tried this task yourself. If you've never tried it, give it a go. Put a mirror in front of you only look in the mirror don't look at your hand and you'll find that actually mirror drawing is quite a hard skill and it's quite hard at the beginning when you first do it to draw between the concentric lines you go outside the lines and your hand doesn't know which way to go so brenda milner gave henry malayson this task he had to draw between the concentric stars only looking at his reflection in a mirror and so the first time he did it he was really rubbish at it as we all are and went out the side the lines loads but the more he did it the better he got because it was a skill that you can develop and he became very proficient at this task but he could never remember having done the, the experiment having done the concentric star mirror drawing task before so every time he was asked to do the task it was as if it um, he didn't remember having done it before, but he got faster and faster and more accurate. And so this experiment, the concentric star experiment, has taught us um, more information about memory, not just that we have long term memory and short term memory, but that we have different types of long term memory. So there are three types of long term memory. If you've done the memory unit, then you will know them. There's semantic memory, which is memory for knowledge about the world. Uh, it includes like general knowledge, like London is the capital of England, and it's it's shared knowledge. The second type of long term memory is called episodic memory, um, and that's where this these are very personal memories to you, where you remember the episodes of your life. So you would remember, for example, that you might have gone to the cinema last week, and you remember who you went with and how you felt and the emotion of the experience those that's called episodic memory and both semantic memory and episodic memory are types of declarative memory and we also call them explicit because they are outside of yourself so declarative memory means that they are not in within you they are things that have happened outside of you and that you can remember them and you can talk about them and so those two types of long-term memory are the memories that Henry Malayson could no longer form. He couldn't learn any new knowledge and he couldn't learn, he couldn't form any new episodic memories. So if he, whatever he experienced, he would not be able to recall it. But the concentric star mem um, task showed us that there is a third type of long-term memory and it's implicit, it's not explicit, it's called procedural memory and it's implicit, it's within you. And you might know it um, from, everyday life as muscle memory. So procedural memory means the skills that you um, learn and you build and every time, you know that saying like practice makes perfect. When you first start doing something, you're not very good at it, but the more you do it, the better you get. So that might be playing an instrument, a musical instrument or um, a sport. And it means that your body remembers what to do. And that's why it's referred to as muscle memory. So this is the third type of long term memory. And you would need to explain that Brenda Milner discovered this um, through the concentric star experiment. And there have been other researchers like Schachter who identified these three different types of long term memory. So that, that these are the overall findings from the case study of Henry Malison that the hippocampus is absolutely essential when it comes to forming new declarative long term memories, um, but that actually procedural memory doesn't require, doesn't rely upon the hippocampus. Your procedural memory can be intact and that's what we call muscle memory. And that's in a different part of the brain. It's called the cerebellum, which we'll look at a bit more in a moment. So that that essentially is the case study of Henry Malayson. And you can you can use this case study in many, many areas of psychology. For example, in the memory unit, we look at this. This is called the multi-store model of memory. And it's um, the whole the model is an explanation of how sensory events become memories in your mind. And so when you when you do the memory unit, you will be learning about how 
information flows through the cognitive process, like through your brain, to be uh, to become long term memory. So it's a linear model goes from left to right. And the case study of Henry Melanson can be used as an evaluation point. So in the exam, if you were asked to outline and evaluate the multi store model of memory, in the AO1, you would just describe, probably draw and describe the multi store model of memory. But the AO3, the evaluation, we can use Henry Melanson as a positive criticism of the multi store model of memory because the neurosurgery that he underwent showed us that there are two distinct, clear unitary stores of memory. So you can see I've circled those. The case study shows us that there is a difference between short term memory and long term memory, which provides evidence, evidential support for the multi store model of memory. So you can use that as a positive criticism. You can also then go on to explain that it's also a negative criticism of the multi store model of memory. So there's our our friend Brenda Milner with the concentric star. So the concentric star experiment that he did indicates that long term memory, which you can see there I've put in red now, that shouldn't be a single store. That should actually, the model should have long term memory split into three and tell us that there are actually three different types of long term memory, which are episodic, semantic and procedural. So the case study of Henry Malayson gives you two evaluation points for the multi store model of memory. In year two, when you do biopsychology and you look at localization of function in the brain, then the Henry Malayson case study can be used as an evaluation point to provide evidence that there is indeed localization of function. So you would use the case study to explain, um, you know, briefly outline what happened to Henry Malayson and and that so the case the case study of HM shows that different parts of the brain are responsible for different types of long term memory. So the hippocampus is critical for forming new declarative memories, but your implicit memories rely on the cerebellum. And so this is good neurosurgical evidence that localization of function does indeed occur. You can also use the case study of Henry, Henry Melison as a negative discussion point for neuroplasticity. So again, this is the biopsychology unit and the idea of neuroplasticity, of course, you'll know from year two is that um, the brain isn't set in stone, actually. Uh, neuroplasti neuroplasticity, that theory says that if there is a pr if something like trauma happens to the brain, then you can the brain can overcome it and different areas will take on different functions. And in fact, the brain is plastic. And this guy here is Lashley, Carl Lashley. He called it the law of equipotentiality. Um, and in terms of like the brain, different parts will chip in to make the brain function again. But the Henry Melison case study can be used as a negative criticism of this to say that that law of equipotentiality is put into question by the case study of HM because his brain never recovered um, in order to be able to form new episodic and semantic long term memories. So it can be you can bring it in as a negative criticism of a neuroplasticity. You can also use the case study in the issues, debates and approaches unit. So um, one of the debates is called the ideographic versus nomothetic approach. Uh, again, this is year two work. So you will know that this is um, a discussion about the best way in which to uh, investigate in psychology. Do you investigate in a nomothetic way, which is looking at big groups of numbers of participants and forming new laws from them. So really the kind of experimental method versus the idea that we should um, study human behaviour through the ideographic approach, which just basically means that you would study individuals in depth. And so the a case study of Henry Melison can be used as a discussion point for the ideographic and nomothetic approach, because obviously the case study is an ideographic approach where you're studying one individual in depth. But it's a really interesting discussion point because actually we can form new theories and laws from the ide ideographic approach that was performed on Henry Malayson, because we know now because of him about different types of long term memory and about the distinction between short and long term memory. So, in fact, the ideographic approach in this case, it's an interesting one because usually with the ideographic approach, it's hard to kind of generate new theories, but with um 
we have gained so much extensive knowledge from the ideographic approach to and studying memory from Henry Melison. Um, you could also talk about the reductionism versus holism debate. So the case study falls very much on the reductionist side of the debate because reductionism means that in order to understand human behaviour, it's best to reduce complex phenomena down to its constituent parts. And when we think about the Henry Malayson case study, the complex phenomena is memory. And in fact, we can understand memory, breaking it down into those constituent parts of long and short term memory, um, breaking it down into different types of long term memory. All of so the Henry Malayson case study falls heavily on that reductionist side of the debate. Um, which is a really good discussion point to talk about. Um, it also, I mean, it reduces it down even more, like really to um, the biological areas in the brain. So the hippocampus being critical for declarative memories and the cerebellum being responsible for procedural memories, implicit memories. So you could bring it in for that. And you could also bring it in for the um, debate of determinism versus free will. And you, it's a, the Henry Melison case study is a really interesting concept here in terms of um, certainly biological determinism that the neurosurgery that he underwent uh, meant that he was determined to have these issues with memory for the rest of his life. Um, and, and draws into question, really, did Henry Melison ever really have free will after the uh, neurosurgery that he experienced? So um, you could you could bring it into that as well as a discussion point. Um, and in research methods, there is a section called case studies. Um, so you could certainly if there was a question that came up about case studies, it's um, then just keep in mind that you already have all loads of information about this HM case study. So keep that in mind. You don't have to invent anything new. And ethics comes within research methods. And the HM case study is a really interesting ethical issue. As I said, you know, Henry Melison should be treated with the absolute utmost respect and with integrity because his life was very, very difficult. But we've learned so much from him. Ethically, you could discuss, you know, that um, would Henry Melison be able to give his informed consent for some of the experiments that took place and for the fact that his brain was scanned and um, dissected after death through post-mortem? Um, it is a bit of an ethical minefield because of the issues that he went through. Would he be uh, able to give informed consent? Um, and also the very research that the very thing that happened to him when Dr Scoville did that initial research, um, though that is a, a huge ethical debate as to whether it should have gone ahead. Although Henry Melison felt that it would be really, really, you know, he couldn't live life as it was, his life changed in a, such a dramatic way. And so all pioneering surgeons, all pioneering people, someone has to go first and, and make that first discovery, as it were. But the implications for Henry Melison was that it, in, you know, it affected his the rest of his life and it must have been incredibly traumatic. So, for example, everyone else was moving on and getting older and he was getting older, but he had no memory of that. So when he would look in the mirror, he'd be expecting to see a 27 year old, but he would see a 47 year old, a 57 year old, you know, up until the age he was 80. That must have been really shocking for him. Um, and it must have been a very difficult life for him. So. The Henry Melison case study is full of ethical debate as well. And I think that is the end of this, um, this video. Um, it's just to really make sure that you know the details of the case study and the findings, but also to consider that you can use that case study in areas of the exam, um, not just related to uh, specifically memory, but um, of course it's incredibly useful for memory, but it's incredibly useful for biopsychology and other issues and debates too. And there are your picture references.